Hello, and welcome back to the channel Q&A. Now, this is only the second Q&A I've done for this channel. This should technically be the, the fourth, because I plan to do this on a monthly basis. But I got COVID, and my recovery has been uh, very slow. <coughs> Excuse me. My recovery's been very slow, and I decided just to take it easy the past couple of months. Um, just do the videos as normal and not try and do um, anything sort of extra on top of it, just to obviously give my, my lungs and my voice a break. But we're back now, I'm feeling quite a bit better. Still got a lingering cough from it, which I'm dealing with, but uh, it's a significant improvement even from a few weeks ago. So, today we're going to be going through some questions that have been asked over on Patreon. Um, this video will be up on Patreon first and then on YouTube. And also I'm going to talk about some general updates for the channel and some plans I have for the future, for the near future and for the far future going into 2023 and even into 2024 as well. But first of all, let's go through the questions now. Where's my little word document, eh? Here we go. So, first question um, from the patrons. Um, these are from June, July, and I've also got some from August. I sort of collated them all. So the first one is from Kevin, and it is, uh, what period of aviation do you find the most fascinating? Now, for me, a lot of people are probably going to guess that I'm going to say the interwar period, because a lot of my videos cover that. But for me, the most fascinating topic is the early few decades of the Cold War. So I'd say 1945 through to, say, the mid to late 1960s, where you've got the dawning of the jet age, all of the early experimental aircraft, you know, from the um, aircraft that were taken from the 262s that were captured from Germany, things like the P-80 Shooting Star, Gloucester Gladiator, de Havilland Vampire, uh, well, Gloucester Gladiator, Gloucester Meteor and de Havilland Vampire, um, going into the early supersonic and then the mid-supersonic era, and all the crazy experimental jets, um, especially developed by uh, the United States and in the United States Air Force. You got things like the XB-70 Valkyrie, for example. I mean, that thing is an amazing feat of engineering, and that kind of goes more into the mid-Cold War area, but that is one of my favorite um, aircraft of all time, and there will be a very, <laughs> there will be a long video on the Valkyrie eventually, it is coming, I'm planning it. Um, I've got like four or five books in one of the bookshelves behind me here on the Valkyrie, um, but that probably won't be until next year because I've got a lot of planning to do on it still. But that particular area where just the, the envelope was being pushed every year, basically, something new was happening, things like, I mean, God, you thought things were becoming obsolete quickly in the 1930s. In the 1950s, it was just as just as nuts, and you had even more technology, and things were going faster, and you had them being tested um, both um, by, you know, NACA and then NASA. And then also you had things that are being proof-tested in war. You know, you had um, Korea, Vietnam, and the various conflicts around the world at the time, and it was just a rapid development. Of course, other things developed as well. Naval, naval vessels, ground equipment, tanks evolved massively between 1945 and 1955 even. There was a huge leap even then. And then, of course, you had the dawn of um, the space age, you know, the first uh, rockets going up, spanning out from the ICBMs and all of that. And uh, I, I am looking at potentially covering aerospace on the channel. Um, I'm just debating whether or not I keep it under Rex's hangar or whether I make it as like a separate thing, but that that's a that's a future me problem. I'm not going to be looking at doing that for at least another year because I've got a lot of other things I want to cover. But yeah, I would say the early Cold War is definitely the most interesting period for me, and honestly we got some of the coolest and weirdest looking planes out of that era, so that is your answer. Now, <clears throat> Moultrie Geeks asked, where did the oft-quoted, the bomber will always get through, originate from? Well, that was quoted from Stanley Baldwin. So in 1932, he gave a speech to the British Parliament, which is now known as a, a fear for the future, which is the name given to the speech. Um, and the bomber will always get through was mentioned in that, and it, it's reflective of the opinion on the bomber at the time. So in the late 1920s, going to the early 1930s, it was commonly believed by most tacticians that future wars would be won by whoever could bomb the other into submission. It wasn't a case of defeating people's armies, it was a case of defeating people, defeating the morale of the country, destroying the infrastructure, you know, killing the civilian populace and destroying the will to fight, as horrible as it sounds. That's what 
many, many people thought was going to be the future of warfare. Now, obviously, in World War II, that kind of had some holes put in it. I mean, you know, bombing was obviously hugely um, important in World War II, but the concept that the bomber will always get through wasn't always true, and especially after the war, with the advent of air-to-air missiles, radar-guided um, anti-air defences, all of that, the, the bomber gets through just slowly just goes like you know you get into missiles and all of that and it just gets ruined but originally it came from that 19 late 1920s 1930s belief the bombers were the way of the future that it was considered such a a leap in destructive warfare that you know there were films about it apocalyptic films about you know how the world was just destroyed by fleets of bombers laying waste to all the capital cities on the world there there are a couple of um, famous and a couple of not-so-famous films from that period all set in these ruined cities that have been just absolutely laid waste by hundreds, if not thousands, of bombers. And, yeah, it wasn't a particularly... It was looked in the same way as the, we, in the way that we look at nuclear Armageddon now. That's how much of a, um, of a scary thing it was, and that's where the bomb will always get through comes from, basically. I know that's probably a really, really bad explanation on my part, but I, um, I don't really want to co- directly quote a book or a Wikipedia article or anything like that in these Q&As. I kind of like to just speak in my own words as best as I can, and when your brain is as broken as I am from coughing your lungs out all the time, it gets a bit hyperbole. But yes, the bomber didn't always get through, but for a time they believed it would. Now, what is the next question? So, um, so Eric Tissot asks, what are your top five personal favorite planes? Is there a type of aircraft that you have no interest in ever covering? Um, so I plan to cover all aircraft eventually. I mean, every aircraft built in existence, I would not be able to cover in my lifetime at the, at the, at the rate of upload that I do. But I plan to cover all types of aircraft if I can. That includes, you know, um, helicopters, all the rest as well. I'm just still gathering research on that. My my main, I wouldn't say expertise because I'm not qualified in any way, but I'm more self, self-learned self and self-taught. But for the past 10 years of my life, my focus has been on learning as much as, much as I can about airplanes. Not, not specifically helicopters, or modern jets, but a lot of my focus has been on traditional fixed-wing aircraft, uh, mostly uh, the interwar period and early Cold War, because those are the top the topics that interest me. Um, in the past couple of years, I've also been poring over a lot of stuff during the First World War as well. The developments of aircraft in the First World War is a hugely deep and interesting topic, and some of my earliest videos on the channel have covered that, but they're getting redone because... Um, Those videos were based off scripts that I'd written about two years before I even started this channel. And when those scripts were first written, I had not done as much research on World War I stuff as I have now. And also, some of the source material I used back then was nowhere near as reliable as the source material I've now gathered here and also in other places not in this room um so it's it's been a learning process and uh, th- there's a reason why i haven't covered much on world war one stuff yet and that's because i don't feel confident in explaining it in the way that i want to explain it yet there's still a bit more reading on to do you know it, it's 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 one thing to simply quote figures it's another to fully understand the reasoning behind why things were done why things were effective why things weren't effective um and that's what really fascinates me about all of this is learning learning not just about the famous aircraft but about the ones that didn't work and why they didn't work that that's just always really fascinated me but my top five personal favorite planes one would be, I know it sounds cliche, the Hawker Hurricane. I just love, it's it's a plucky British aircraft that pulled its weight during the Battle of Britain. Um, another one would be the MiG-15. I just, again, it's an aesthetics thing. Quintessential early um, Cold War fighter, you know, very famous for its uh, role in, in the Korean War and following that as well uh, with MiG Alley um, in Vietnam. I would say number three would be oh god, um, number three would be the Dornier DOX, which is the big flying boat from the late nineteen twenties, early nineteen thirties. Um, I mentioned that in the previous Q and A video. 
my favourite flying bird of all time, definitely my top five favourite planes of all time. Number four. Number four would be the XB-70 Valkyrie, as I mentioned earlier on. Massive, fast, supersonic bomber. Looks like something out of a Thunderbirds episode. I mean, what's not to like about the XB-70? It's gorgeous. And number five, I mean, God, picking a top five is difficult as it is. Um, number five, again, it's probably going to sound cliche, but I really did like the lines of the Vought F4U Corsair. Obviously, a lot of people probably have this as one of their favorite aircraft. I just love the way it looks. The wings, it's just, it's such a... A noticeable silhouette, like you can pick it out from anything. You know, if you see if you see the outline of that aircraft, you know what it is. And you know, obviously had such a huge role in the Pacific War as well. But my top five favorite list is pretty much on aesthetics. So I would say yeah, Corsair be number five. Uh, Mary Kiesling asked, "Can you do a video on the P forty seven Thunderbolt?" A request from my hubby. Yes, a Thunderbolt video is definitely definitely on its way. Um, I'm not sure when it will be here, um, the, the, what I call the big ticket aircraft from the Second World War, it's a big undertaking to do a video on those, and for those ones it's probably going to be a two-parter, kind of like what I did on the Vickers Wellington, so I'd probably say I would do a two-part video on the Thunderbolt, I might be able to make it a single video, and then I, I might do, my, my plan is something along the lines of, one video would kind of cover the the story of the aircraft, you know, where it came from, why it was important, what was it, what what did it do? And then I was thinking of a second video where we sort of more d delve into the technical developments of the aircraft, you know, the different variants and why they were built the way they were built. I think kind of splitting it up like that might be a better way of doing it, but, you know, let me know in the comments if you think there's another way it could be done. But for stuff like the P-43... P-43 there. The P-47 Thunderbolt, the Spitfire, uh, Mustang, BF-109, Fokker Wolf 190s, um, all of those are probably going to be multi-part videos. They are coming, and it's definitely not going to be something I'm going to be holding fire on for long, but it'll be a case of, you know, one month at a time. So, you know, I might do a video, I might start videos next month, say, on the P-47, and then maybe a couple of months later I'll, I'll have had enough research and everything done for the next aircraft. But those sort of ones take a lot of time, a lot of research. I obviously want to get them right, because God forbid if I get anything wrong, uh, I'll know about it. But, um, you know, and making those sort of videos, I want to improve the quality as well, which is another reason why I'm slowing down the upload schedule for these videos, is if I have more time to work on each individual one, they're obviously going to be better. Now, between each upload, it's not literally like I'm researching a plane, doing the script, uploading it, researching the plane, doing the script, uploading it. The research in the script is usually being worked on massively in advance. Um, I usually work on five or six scripts simultaneously because I find if I work on one for too long, I get tunnel vision on certain topics and certain points of development and I... I lose the thread of what I want the whole video to be about, and if I bounce between research topics and um, scripts with obviously very detailed notes left on what I was up to, I find it easier to focus on the original vision that I had for that video, whereas if I just focused on one all the time, I, I tend to get, not sidetracked, but I, I tend to go down a different route that I would have done if I just took a step back and observed where I was going with the whole thing. But Yes, P-47, another aircraft like that, definitely coming. Now, Jack Kiwi Bricks asks, If you were to get your pilot's license and had the ability to fly any warbird or aircraft of your choosing, what would you fly and why? Oh. You see, I would say one of the warbirds from the Second World War, but honestly, I'd love to get my hands on a Cold War era supersonic jet or something like that, because speed, it's fun. Um, I would love to fly in an F-4 Phantom, definitely. They're one of my favourite aircraft from that period. Um, proof that with enough thrust, even a flying brick works. So I would say, yeah, probably flying in a Phantom would be one of the big ones. Obviously a Tomcat's another one. Um, Warbird specifically, Spitfire would obviously be the obvious choice, but it's not for me. I would personally still prefer to go up in a Hurricane as opposed to a, a Spitfire. 
particularly in early model Hurricane, one of the originals that, you know, obviously would have flown around the Battle of Britain and hear that nice, deliciously sounding Merlin engine. So yes, uh, either a either a Phantom or a Hurricane, two two very very different aircraft, but but there you have it. Um, now another question is uh, again this is by Eric. Um, was there an event or a person or situation that sparked your interest in airplanes, and what's your background? Um, <clears throat> I kind of mentioned it in a previous video that one of the earliest things that sparked my interest in aviation was the film Those Magnificent Men in Their Flying Machines. That was definitely one of the earliest memories I have of being interested in aircraft, but in general it's something that's just grown over over time. Um, it wasn't a, a passion that I could really heavily invest myself in in my late teens, early 20s, just going to, to life situations and things like that, but now that I'm more settled, um, far more settled, I can really... I really enjoy my uh, my passion for it a lot more. Now, my background before this, I was at university for a little while. I was doing a degree in game design because I'm a huge nerd. I've played video games since I was about four. Um, and I found that I had quite a good talent for programming and coding. So I was going in to get into the programming side of things. And then the YouTube channel took off and I was like, you know what? At the rate this is going, this is probably going to be a more stable income for me than uh, working in game development at the moment, because it's a very competitive industry. So I put the degree on hold for the foreseeable future to see where all of this takes me instead, because, you know, make hay whilst the sun shines and all that. And um, before that, I just worked in corporate and finance, insurance, that kind of stuff. The, the, the sort of stuff that I guess a lot of people find themselves in, like just normal normal jobs. When I finished high school, I had no real idea of what sort of career I wanted, so I just went and found the best paying jobs I could get just so that I could live, pay my bills like most normal people. Um, I, I had thought about traveling, but other things that I won't go into get in, got in the way of that, but I'm doing a bit more traveling now. Um, but yeah, I'd say that film sparked my interest in aircraft and then a bunch of other things since then sort of just built it up to its current fevered pitch where I talk about planes on a daily and weekly basis. Uh, now, Andrew Mack asks, um, if you were to be a billionaire, would you commission a flying boat in addition to a yacht? I can imagine nothing better than flying around the world in a modern China clipper. Definitely a big flying boat over a yacht. If I if I had stupid amounts of money, I'd love my own personal flying boat. It'll never happen, and um, I don't think I'd ever have that much money. But you know, in 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 a world where where money was no object and I could have what I want, I would absolutely love a a modern flying boat, one that could um you know happily cruise along the waters or fly to very high, comfortable altitude above the clouds and thus above the turbulence. So it would clearly have to be a flying boat with uh jet engines, maybe something like the um, the never used uh, Saunders Row uh, Duchess or Queen, because the Princess was a big old prop aircraft and I don't think it would have gotten to a comfortable altitude, but Saunders and Row did design some other flying boats that never got off the waves, and uh, one of those would probably be a good place to start and build off a design from that. Uh, so those are the general questions out of the way. As I said, I paused the whole Q&A thing during COVID, so there weren't a lot of questions to really answer. Some I've already answered already as it is in previous videos and stuff, so that sort of cut down on what I could talk about. But I want to talk about some general updates for the channel and some plans for the future. So one of the big things I'm doing at the moment is I have been teaching myself uh, 3D modeling and animation. Now, getting good quality stock footage and things like that uh, for YouTube is incredibly expensive because they basically um, want to charge you the same rates they would charge a full TV production studio, essentially, which I get it. Like, you know, YouTube and online media is the, the biggest competitor for TV now, and they can, they can essentially pick and choose their rates because who else is going to supply the stock footage? No one else has it. Um, so in the past year, when I've been trying to get stock footage from various companies, some have been very kind and have offered me very good rates. Uh, some have not. Uh, some people have been charging me as much as 50 US dollars per second 
of footage. And if you do the maths on that for a five minutes clip or something like that, that is thousands upon thousands of dollars. Um, which is even more in, in Australian dollars, so, you know, completely untenable in the long run. And I thought, stuff it. If I can't get the stock footage or video footage of an aircraft, I will do it myself with models that I'm either creating or models that I've bought online from various people that do 3D modeling. There is a huge 3D modeling community online now. And I've spoken with a lot of online 3D modelers, and they have been more than happy to work with me either building new models or let me use existing models. I'm always reaching out to more people to find what I can get, what I can use. So if anyone watching this video is into 3D modeling and design and wants to, you know, have, have a 3D model essentially showcased in a video, let me know, send me an email because I will be um, happy to talk with you and work with you and figure out a, a, a video or a plan or something. But um, it's not just the aircraft that I'm doing models for. I'm building literal um, scenery, background, Everything from clouds to mountains, all of that stuff. It's been a really fun learning experience. Again, I kind of already had some of these skills from working on my degree in game design, but now I'm building on that. Uh, now, to facilitate this, I had to build a completely separate computer, which is off screen here, but it is a monster because my current computer cannot handle the sheer quantity of number crunching that you need to do if you want to do good quality 3D animation. Like if it's something basic, that one can handle it fine. Uh, but what you need really is a couple of 3090s and an NV link. So you need something with the power to kickstart a dying star, basically. Um, so that's what I've got over there. So that's, um, that's where half of my money's gone is into building that thing. So hopefully it pays off. Hopefully it's it's a big investment in the channel. I'm really hoping it pays off and it improves the quality of the videos. Um, so stay tuned for more on that over the next couple of months. I'm going to start pumping out some animations to go into videos and also just some showcases to show like how, how I've developed, how I've learned, how to, how to improve everything with animating because it, it is a huge uh, learning curve doing stuff. And if people are wondering, I'm doing it with Blender because it's open source, it's free, and it's honestly a very powerful program. Um, surprisingly easy to learn. It looks very... Okay, it is difficult to learn, but it's surprisingly easy to initially get into. It just looks very um, intimidating. Lots of things, lots of buttons, lots of different ways you can do stuff. But after a couple of months, I'm now very comfortable with Blender. So hopefully um, we'll start seeing stuff like that featuring in the videos in the semi near future. Now the whole video isn't obviously going to be full of animations. I'm just doing it to add to the existing quality of the video. It's not going to replace what I'm doing. It's not going to replace all the footage. It's not going to replace the, the photos, drawings and sketches that I'm using. It's going to complements them it's going to go along with them so it's it's i'm not going to be scrapping the way that i do, do videos now so don't panic about that but hopefully this will bring up the quality to a new level fingers fingers crossed anyway now since the last q a i've also done quite a few longer videos on the channel um and that that trend will continue i'm going to still do videos that are less than 20 minutes long for certain things but there are some topics that are going to need a long video, and there are some topics that are going to need multi-part long videos. I'm talking about specific events in aviation history. Um, obviously, I have plans to cover some big keynotes of aviation, um, not only World War II and the Cold War, but also other 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 things that aren't really hugely well known, but I don't want to spoil what all my plans are. But obviously things like the Battle of Britain, I'm obviously going to cover um, the, the the air war, um, the Eastern air war over Cuban, Central Russia, all of that, or not Central, Western Russia during the um, during the Second World War. Obviously the air wars in the, in the Pacific. I want to do some videos that cover specific aerial doctrine, the, you know, what was behind the formation of the huge thousand bomber raids over Europe with Bomber Harris and all of that. So all of that is to come, which will obviously include things like Big Week, uh, the Dam Buster Raid, all of that. But those those are going to be long videos for obvious reasons, because, I mean, I could cover it in a 10 minute video, but it would only really be scratching the surface of that particular topic. And I want to do that particular topic justice because I thoroughly enjoy learning about it and reading about it and 
I a lot of my earliest readings on aviation when I first started collecting books and stuff was on those particular things. Initially, my fascination with aviation was less about the aircraft and more about the events. The the technical uh, fascination has been uh, more of a recent development, a, a kind of a late blooming development. So originally, I was more fascinated about the people and the events, but now I'm equally fascinated by the technology. So all of that is coming as well. Now. Sorry, just not the desk. Now, a final thing I want to talk about is um, I have started a Twitch account. I haven't actually streamed anything on Twitch yet, but I've literally set up a Twitch account today, the day of recording this, um, and I plan to probably do some live Q&As on Twitch. But the main reason I want to do Twitch is honestly just to have a bit of fun. Um, I do quite a bit of gaming in my spare time because... Not only because I enjoy it, but most of my friends are overseas, and the, the most we can socialize is with online games and things like that. Um, so there's going to be a lot of things like um, IL-2 Stimovic, War Thunder, DCS, but also streaming other stuff as well, like Subnautica, um, Age of Empires, Civ, and whatever else I feel like playing. So that's probably going to be something I'm going to be doing in the very near future. It's probably going to be a weekend thing, or maybe a one night during the week. Whether or not it's actually going to be to a set schedule is another question that I haven't figured out yet. It's probably going to be just random. But uh, if you're interested in seeing that kind of stuff and interacting and joining in on the fun, then my Twitch details should be coming up on the screen now, hopefully. If not, then I've done something horribly wrong with the editing and I need to obviously have another cup of coffee. But that is it for today's q and I apologize if it, if it feels very off the cuff and ragtag, that's because it is. I hadn't really planned to do a Q&A today, but a, a video that I had planned uh, for earlier on this week uh, hit a massive snag, and this is kind of an emergency measure. I had to do it anyway, so I might as well get it out of the way. But that is um the Q&A for September, and we will be back for an October Q&A as well. And then in the beginning of November, I am going to be taking a couple of weeks off. There will still be videos going up, but I will be taking a couple of weeks off um, and visiting my partner and her family, uh, because we haven't seen each other for about five months nearly, so, uh, overdue for a visit. But that is all for today. Again, apologise if there's too much rambling going on, but I don't do live speaking particularly well. But, um, thank you all so much, and I will see you next month.